In 1950, Alan Turing asked the question, can machines think? Well, this is a year a computer named Cleverbot has come closer than ever to proving him that they can, but with all this change, development can be computing. How does Turing continue to dominate the way we understand technology today? Mark Bishop, Chair of the Society for the Study of Artificial Intelligence and Simulation of Behaviour. Mark, welcome to the Other One Show. Hello. Um, this is... Um, this is quite a, 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 a good way of thinking on it, that um, Turing saying what he said has still affected the way that we're, we're uh, viewing um, artificial intelligence. Yeah, it's a very prescient paper that was written in 1950. Um, Turing sort of was musing on the idea of what it means to think and whether indeed we could ever say of a machine that it can think in a manner analogous to a human. And in this paper, Turing came up with what's become known as the Turing test, <coughs> which is a procedure that he outlined for determining if we can say of a machine that can genuinely think. And this test basically says, can a human who's uh, interacting with another human in a, lo in a room and a machine, a computer that's in the room, can the interrogator accurately decide which room holds the computer and which room holds the other human? Isn't it funny that we're doing this? Because I've just seen on the BBC website, they've, got, they're gonna, they've commissioned a pilot for a TV programme called Cloned. And I think the contestants have to decide, uh, out of four people, uh, which one is a computer-generated one. <laughs> that's excellent. That's, a, that's another version of the test. Yeah. That's, that's a really interesting idea. One of the stumbling blocks with this, though, Mark, is the, this kind of emotional side, yeah. of whether that can be sorted out in a computer's uh, memory and, and uh, working sort of habits. Um, are we any closer to sorting that part out? That's, that's a really interesting uh, uh, point that you've made there, because... Um, it's been pointed out that even if a computer, by following sets of rules, can give correct responses in a conversation such that at some point in time the computer might actually pass the Turing test and fool an interrogator that it's another human, it's extremely unlikely that the computer will feel anything emotional. The analogy I always give when I talk about these things is if you are talking to a sm explaining a joke to a small child, an adult joke, shall we say. Yes. And the child might laugh, but you know damn well that that child hasn't really understood the joke in the way that an adult has. It hasn't felt the feeling of laughter inside. It's just pretended to. So it's the sort of difference between the simulation of a thing, the simulation of thinking, which I think computers will probably be able to do fairly well, and actually thinking itself. And I think there's something different there. And you really hit the nail on the head when you talked about emotions and feelings, because it isn't obvious to me how a computer program can ever genuinely instantiate emotions and feelings. Yeah, and of course, the other thing as well is when you give a, a you do it, we'll carry on with the joke analogy a bit longer, Mark, is that um, sometimes you need the context, even where it's historical <coughs> or even sociological, you need that moment to get that reference point to understand the joke and you'd have to put piles of stuff into a computer's memory to go well in the reason he said that by the way is this yeah. happened you know in, in the previous times yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah exactly that's just that's a difficulty but you might argue that's a mere technological difficulty if we had enough time to program these systems really well we might you can imagine some team of geeks programming away for year after year, getting all this contextual information there. So it's possible to think that at some point in time, you might have a computer that will have all the right contextual information, but nonetheless, it won't have that feeling, that emotional in information, you know, the actual feeling in your gut when you actually hear a, a hilarious joke that really makes you laugh out loud. The computer will never have that, it seems I to me. I can't wait for the first <coughs> chat, the chat show that uh, a computer host Mark, or even the DJ... We've got a thing called the Linkatron, which is something we we uh, we asked the BBC to come up with, and it uh, introduces our songs for us. And I can't think of a decent link. The Linkatron does it for me, Mark, and, <laughs> and it's pr it's pretty good because it doesn't have any moods. It's, it's the same all the way through. You're telling uh, me you have moods? Yeah, <laughs> occasionally. This, you know, um, I mean, the other things, is, uh, you know, is feeding in things like hangovers and things like that. You know, working with somebody with a hangover is a different thing from working with somebody without a hangover, Mark. Well, well it's a professor of cognitive computing, of course. I would never have. Seen <laughs> that, I wouldn't know all about that. <laughs> Mark, thanks a lot. We'll keep in touch. Uh, okay, then, sir. Thanks for your call. All right, Mark Bishop, the uh, chair of the Society for the uh, Study of Artificial Intelligence.